Welcome to Next Economy Now. The goal of this podcast series is to highlight the leaders who are taking a regenerative, bioregional, equitable, democratic, racially just, and whole systems approach to creating the new economy. I'm Ryan Honeyman, a partner at Lyft Economy. My guest today is Edgar Villanueva. Edgar is an award-winning author, activist, and expert on issues of race, wealth, and philanthropy, and he's the principal of the Decolonizing Wealth Project and Liberated Capital. Edgar's best-selling book, Decolonizing Wealth, which was first published in 2018 and recently had the second ed- edition published in 2021, has been called a wake-up call to philanthropy. Edgar advises a range of organizations, including national and global philanthropies, Fortune 500 companies, and entertainment on social impact strategies to advance racial equity from within and through their investment strategies. Edgar has been on Next Economy Now twice before in 2018 and 2019. And, you know, not much has changed since 2019, right, Edgar? It's pretty much the same world as before. It's... (laughs) I mean, in many ways, it's yeah, the same, much, right? <laughs> and then in many ways, it's a lot different. <laughs> so I invited Edgar back to discuss the, the recent publication of his second edition of his book, discuss what he's most excited about now, some any emergent opportunities he's exploring, and what progress there's been towards building a movement to decolonize wealth. So Edgar, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me back. Third time's a charm. Well, I'm going to point folks to the first two episodes of our interview to go into Edgar's background because I'm hesitant to have him recapitulate it a third time <laughs> on this call. But maybe we could jump in a little bit more on to some of the current stuff you're working on, Edgar. And I'm curious, with the new second edition of your book, could you describe you know, what the book is about and then what's changed maybe in this new second edition, just to ground folks in your work? Sure. Decolonizing Wealth, the first edition, as you said, came out in 2018. I would say at that time, the book was hyper-focused on the industry of philanthropy and finance and kind of what's broken. And in the story there, it's, it's really the history of colonization and how wealth has been accumulated in the United States through a lot of extraction and human rights violations, namely slavery, genocide, land grabbing, those kinds of things, and how those dynamics of colonization um, show up and impact the work that we are doing present day, even in philanthropy, because we're, we're working with money that has been used to, to harm folks in the past. And so what are the opportunities for healing there and seeing money as medicine to repair what has happened? And um, I think that book, you know, became a surprising bestseller and really has shifted the narrative and maybe even the weather and philanthropy in a lot of ways. And I love to see like conferences being held on decolonizing philanthropy. And like, it, it's really a framework that's been widely adopted in the sector. And I think that, you know, well, I actually know there have been many, many very positive impacts and outcomes and how funders are changing their behaviors. Second edition um, that came out in August of 2021, I decided to write an update because the world did change in 2020. Um, I saw the need for more and more and more healing. Um, and many of the issues that we talked about in the first edition in terms of systems that, that are fragile and broken and not serving people of color, the inequalities that we talk about became so even more visible. And there was a more, more folks in 2020 kind of woke up and and began to understand what was happening in indigenous communities because of the pandemic and in black communities because of the murder of George Floyd. And so I thought this was an opportunity to really capture a new base of folks who were coming into this conversation and also to expand support and healing and resources and money to social movements that push to get us there. Also, I think what began to happen since the first book came out and and sort of three years later is the implementation of this framework and how how organizations, foundations and corporations, all types of organizations begin to actually adopt the framework and do this. I had examples and case studies of of impact that I wanted to share because I think early on, uh, you know, maybe what I was putting out in the world was a pipe dream. 
And there are even things that I asked for that I thought, oh, I'll never see this in my lifetime. And then surprisingly, I began to see people do it and foundations make changes. And I was like, this is actually possible. And so I wanted to bring in those inspirational stories of folks who are stepping up and doing this work as a model that this actually is modern philanthropy. This is not a radical pie in the sky. I won an award in 2018 as the most radical or 2019, maybe the most radical crit- critic of philanthropy. And I'm like, this is no longer, no longer radical. This is just modern philanthropy and what we do now. That is incredible. And I, I'm wondering too, the way that you wrote the book is very much not a shaming critique. You framed it as like a love letter to philanthropy. And I'm wondering, do you think that that had a sort of a, were you able to change more hearts and minds, you think, because of that framing? Yeah, absolutely. You know, white fragility is real. Donor fragility is real. I think when you are an organizer, you know, regardless of the issue and the target of your organizing, you have to center and or understand the interests of the folks that you're trying to influence. And in philanthropy, you know, I don't, I don't want to center or cater too much to white fragility, but it, it's, a, it's very pervasive, right? And I think it's also a, an industry where there's just a lot of power and taking power from people or coming in and demanding power is something that it has not really happened before and is not what I see as a, an extremely effective tactic in this space, right? Like there is a time to fight and there's a time to, um, sort of appeal to the interests of people or translate it in a different way. And so because I had worked inside the belly of the beast, I kind of really understood those interests and the ways to sort of package a conversation that would invite people to the table. And that approach is deeply centered in indigenous worldview and our idea of restorative justice. You know, we absolutely stand up and fight when it's time to fight, but we also are people that have practices of of forgiving. And we understand that in order for us to heal, we have to bring the oppressor into a circle of healing. And so I really have tried to practice the idea of all my relations to see that these organizations and folks who are doing things that are potentially harming communities may have good intentions. And can I, uh, you know, see them as a relative and invite them into a conversation and see them as people that also need healing from white supremacy, right? And um, it's obvious how white supremacy has harmed my community, but it's harming all of us. And if I can bring that sort of collective um, idea to the table about the the harm that's happening, they might be willing to engage in sort of a collective healing process. So that has been my approach. And I don't water down facts. I don't water down the truth, but it is an approach and sort of a, a nuanced way to navigate the space and to engage people in conversations that are not extremely threatening, but kind of couched in love and warmness. And that has allowed me to to be invited in. So, you know, I I think it was the right way to go. I could have absolutely ripped philanthropy a new one and been like, whatever. And um, I would not be invited probably into certain meetings. And I know I wouldn't be having these one-on-ones with with certain high net worth individuals and, and, and whatnot. So, it's it's an approach and um, there's an inside strategy and there's an outside strategy. There's a time to fight. And there's a time to negotiate. So um, I think all of those tactics are necessary. Yeah, I I view you and like Anand Girdardas as two people who I've felt have really, you know, Anand is definitely more of the I'll call you out on Twitter. <laughs> And if I'm speaking on a panel with you at a conference, I'm going to like really, I'm going to call you out in a way that's maybe going to shame you. And he still gets a lot of results and a lot of airtime. Um, I'm curious, what are some of the things that you didn't think were possible in like 2018 when you fr- wrote the first edition? Like, what are some examples of things that have completely shifted now that you're like, wow, this is really happening? You know, there's been a number of things. I mean, one, I will say in the book, something that I did that slightly was taboo was to actually talk about sort of foundation culture and the abuse of power and what happens, the experiences of of people of color and other marginalized folks who work in these institutions. That had been like a dirty little secret. And so, uh, you know, I, I was pretty forthright in naming 
people and organizations and institutions um, based off of my own experience. I, I tried to package that in the most loving way, but I did tell my story there um, and the story of a, a lot of other folks that had those experiences. And uh, what I've seen shift internally in foundation culture is sort of a people are more empowered to speak up. And I've seen people speaking up about, hey, this is not appropriate. This is not OK to be to treat people this way. I've seen uh, leaders in philanthropy terminated because of um, being called out. And not that I'm, you know, I definitely don't want to be a part of a witch hunt and those types of things. But there absolutely has been uh, sort of abuse of leadership and, and things that have happened that have gone, you know, without accountability. So I, I think a lot of people felt seen in me sharing my story and just empowered to kind of speak up in, in situations. And there's a little bit more in place to hold leaders accountable and not to allow power to go unchecked and and whatnot. So that's that's just like one small internal thing. But the big ideas that I'm really excited about, you know, I think one of the things I called for in the book is this this thought that uh, you know foundations should just take 10% of their endowments and basically hand it over to people of color. I'm like, you know, it's a tie thing. I just chose the number 10 arbitrarily because of growing up in a Christian tradition where you give 10% of your, your um, income away. So I thought, you know, yeah, grant making and increasing your grant making is important, but like, let's like go tap into the, the big wealth. And frankly, 10% is not that much. Like people probably could gain it back in like months, depending on the market. Right. So I put that idea out there and it was just really, I remember I was in Canada um, traveling not long after the book came out and, a foundation CEO there, the McConnell Foundation, came up to me and said, hey, you know, that 10% thing you talked about, we're actually doing that. And I was like, what? <laughs> I would love to chat with you to learn more about that. And Steve, the president there, and I, I tell this story in the second edition, he um, organized with some other foundations and said, hey, you know what? We are funding Native communities. We need to do better to support First Nations folks in Canada but while we're doing that, can we also just a group of us carve off some of our endowments and create like a indigenous led fund so they have their own foundation and they can do what they want to with that money? That is really amazing. And then fast forward to 2020, um, I got a call from the Bush Foundation in St. Paul and the Bush Foundation serves, I forget, six or eight states and, and several native nations in that area. They are a typical middle of the road kind of foundation. I don't think they uh, describe them would describe themselves as a social justice kind of foundation, but very practical folks. And they uh, the board read the book and actually decided to have a debate. Like, you know, given given the privilege that we've had as an institution with wealth, let's debate actually what would happen if we decided to do some of this stuff. So they simply made space for imagination, for a conversation. I got called in to begin having some conversations with the staff and advising them. And they decided to take the equivalent of 10% of their endowment to just basically, basically hand over. They're starting or launching or giving away whatever the right words might be two trust funds that will be completely owned by the community, 50 million for the black community and 50 million for the native community. And those trust funds will redistribute money to individuals like sort of they don't want to call it reparations. It's not the language they're choosing to use, but it's reparations. And my, by my definition, are reparative giving directly to individuals in that in those communities who have not had the same types of opportunities to build wealth. So that story, um, Jennifer and I wrote, it, wrote, up, um, wrote up that experience in the USA Today and did some clubhousing about it. Is really remarkable. And I'm like, if the Bush Foundation can have space for a conversation and do something awesome like that, it just really demonstrates that it's really possible to do something outside the box. Yeah. And we spoke before we started recording about Mackenzie Scott and her approach to philanthropy. And it's, it's, it's weird. I'm, I'm finding myself even having some reservation about celebrating any philanthropist who's like, a multi-billionaire and like just giving money away. Like it feels weird to say, isn't it great that Mackenzie Scott did this? Because it's, you know, she made the money back, right? Just because the stock market. And then I don't want to center the white philanthropists who have money anyway. But I, I'm curious, how do you hold that tension of like, yes, 
maybe you could describe to folks what she did. And, and then how do you hold that tension of how do we not necessarily celebrate what's just reasonable and like what should be common practice, I guess? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I love that. I am I'm down with what Mackenzie Scott is doing. And, you know, I think that we should just say that Mackenzie Scott is the former wife of Jeff Bezos, founder of Amazon. So just so folks know who that is. Sorry, go ahead. Edgar. That's right. That's no good clarification. Yeah, I think that, you know, Mackenzie, one reason that I really appreciate her be, beyond the, the billions of dollars that are going to groups who have not um, historically had access to that type of capital I actually appreciate her attitude about it. Like in her very first announcement about this, this funding, which is on medium, like she didn't put out a press release. She didn't do anything big. She just kind of dropped a note and on her uh, medium blog page. And she acknowledged in that very first post that kind of like downplaying it herself, like in my own words, but basically saying something to the effect of, you know, I, I'm doing what I should be doing. I don't need a, a praise for that. And I have to acknowledge that, you know, the fact that it's un, the system isn't fair, the way that I've been able to build wealth. And this is kind of like what I should be doing to try to give back um, since I've unfairly benefited from a system that's been rigged in my favor. And so the fact that she acknowledged that as a part of why she was doing it was, was major for me, because that's a big part of what I do at Decolonizing Wealth Project is helping folks understand, you know, there there is a system at play that that is rigged uh, to provide accumulated advantages for white folks and especially white folks with wealth, and there are, there's a system that has provided accumulated disadvantages for others, and so that acknowledgement was like big check mark for me, like yes, Mackenzie Scott, and then of course the way that she has given money. And I, I should disclose that I've received money from Mackenzie Scott. We were in this latest round of funding, and it was the easiest money I've ever received. I literally just provided like an EIN number. There's no application. There's no the, – the team working to make that happen were super friendly and nice and accommodating. It was like going to a restaurant and making – placing an order for a grant. It was like I want – my steak cooked this way. I want it chopped up or not chopped up. <laughs> like, what, well, however you wanted your grant to be tailored to meet your organizational needs, it, that's what they were willing to do. And there were, you know, there's no strings attached. And so I really appreciate that approach. And it's, you know, significant investment that's made a world of difference to, to many, many organizations. So I think that she is in her giving really redefining like what's possible. And the fact that she's prioritizing equity as a lens, I think, is really sending a strong message. The pushback that I hear from the sector kind of uh, about her kind of makes me chuckle a little bit because I think there are people who are mad about some things. Namely, let's see, so, you know, I, someone said to me recently, I just don't like that it's not transparent because I want to learn what all these organizations are doing. So they should have to do reports and all these and I'm like, you know, I, I think you're mad about it. If you want to learn what organizations are doing, go to our website, read. We put things out. No one is operating in the dark over here. But I, I think this was a person who was wedded to uh, systems of control. And, like, you know, and this this freedom that we've been given is something that was uncomfortable. And this this was another nonprofit leader who was just like, why are you wishing control on my organization or, you know, um, because you say you want to learn. That makes no sense to me. I also think that there's a lot of questioning going around recently, the Chronicle Philanthropy. See, I don't mind naming names sometimes. Re recently, the Chronicle Philanthropy was what I, I felt like it was borderline harassment, was reaching out to several groups funded by Mackenzie Scott. And I ended up getting wrapped up in a, a, a group email these were all leaders of color run, doing work, racial equity work and a journalist there was one was really uh f you know threatening folks saying hey, you need to disclose what you, how much you got or how you're going to be using that money or we're going to put you on a list of people who refuse to disclose that and they're doing this in the name of research wanting to understand how mckenzie is giving giving and the trends behind all of that. And, you know, research is good, but I was like, this is really suspect to me. I think that there is a 
what I call white lash, an undercurrent that's happening right now where uh, because people of color are finally beginning to get some resources, now we are wanting, you know, the industry is wanting to hold us to a different standard and want to, wants to police us around that, wants us to, um, you know, report out or disclose all these things like expectations that have never been placed on white organizations, which I think is really unfair. I think there's a movement, an undercurrent that's saying, you know what, you all got big checks like for 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 the, your COVID and for racial justice. Now, like, leave us alone. Let us go back to doing our grant making as we as we were. And so we're seeing this progress, and at the same time, there everyone is not here for it. There's an undercurrent of white supremacy and sort of racist kinds of things that are happening that I'm experiencing. So this is why I will not critique McKenzie because she understands the system that's at play. I want to see her. I would love to see her do more to like push back on that and, con- and continue to give away more of her wealth. It's really hard to do when you're literally acquiring wealth at such a rapid pace. But, you know, I know that uh, she and her new husband have been disruptive in places like, you know, I wouldn't say they're class traders, like a non might, that's a term he uses, but um, I think they're doing more than people see. And, you know, and I, I know just firsthand that the, the funding is changing. It is so transformative for so many organizations that are doing the work of, of justice and equity. So hats off to that, you know, and haters. Gonna I love hate. it. <laughs> well, you mentioned that you are a recipient and, can you give folks an overview of Decolonizing Wealth Project more broadly, but also Liberated Capital and what you're up to with that? Yeah. So since the book came out in 2018, I launched a nonprofit, Decolonizing Wealth Project. And the, the, we, we essentially have – we've grown rapidly in a few years. And there's sort of three areas of work. One is around philanthropic practice. And so we – create tools, resources. We have a workshop. We do all kinds of trainings for funders and folks in finance to to really try to continue to disrupt the space. And our North Star is to uh, divert resources to Black and Indigenous communities and really with a reparations kind kind of lens behind that. So a part of that is our um, fund, uh, Liberated Capital, which I'll circle back to talk about in just a moment. The second part of our work is um, really around healing. We hold um, healing summits and do programming because we believe that reparations without truth and healing and reconciliation is just a transaction. And so we also um, want to do the work of healing. And we are bringing traditional ancestral practices of healing from communities where we literally hold ceremony into these very corporate, you know, spaces that lack spirituality. Because we think um, and and understand that to, to really shift our behavior and attitudes and practices around equity, that there's some there's a spiritual component to that work. And part of the thing that gets in the way is that we haven't done our own healing. And by we, I mean indigenous people of color and white people. So we are we're creating and have done in the past year a lot of programming around that space. And then finally, we do work around narrative change. So we're really, um, you know, working to shift the narrative around reparations, to elevate narratives around truth, healing, and through all types of partnerships in the entertainment industry and with different groups are trying to bring visibility uh, to all the issues that stand in the way of closing the race wealth gap. So it's been um, really, really remarkable like scaling quickly an organization that just is getting its feet under it. We have a staff of eight. Our fund, Liberated Capital, um, which is which started in 2019, we uh, raised about $5 million last year. We have a couple million dollars in an impact investing fund where I'm learning so much. That's like a lot of learning for me to do there, but I have great people helping me with that. And then we deployed um, just over $3 million last year to 100% Black and Native organizations um, doing, we did a lot of COVID work. We did a, we launched the very first direct cash payments program for Native Americans where we got money to 2,100 Native families across the country, including families who are not banked and have like a PO box and like really hard to kind of get mail to sometimes. We figured that out and made that happen. So it's really amazing. Uh, this year, two of our big focuses for 
funding is uh, we just announced a few weeks ago $1.7 million that went to 23 uh, mostly Black, a few Native-led organizations working on reparations campaigns across the country. And um, we just heard this week a victory for Justice for Bruce, Bruce's Beach, which is one of our grantees who's been fighting for the return of land to the, um, at Bruce's Beach that belonged to Black folks in California. And, you know, she said on a video that she made about the grant that it's the first time she's ever been able to pay her staff, like it's just volunteers doing this work. And so that's really, really amazing. And I think we're at a point now, there's a groundswell of support for reparations and we're fueling that movement to, to do that work. And then our newest initiative, we have, have an open RFP right now to fund indigenous-led work around climate and conservation. Just understanding that the majority of the, of the earth is guarded and protected by uh, indigenous folks, but yet we're not recognized and we're not resourced to do that work. So that's a new initiative that we, we want to change and see more resources directed to that leadership. You know, you spoke about something that I think resonates so deeply with me, which I wouldn't necessarily consider if I was just thinking about philanthropy or like, or grant making is the the healing and like trauma work. Can you speak? Because it feels like there's a lot of collective trauma. I mean, collective trauma has been coming up for a long time, but it seems like people are more willing to, some people are more willing to sit with it and like process. And I'm curious, how, what are some of the practices or how, what is your approach to dealing with that healing and trauma work? And yeah, I'm just curious to learn more about what you're doing in that space. Sure. So, I mean, most people, uh, if not all, have some kind of trauma connected to money, whether you grew up without money or you grew up with money. It is just this thing, right, that is really uncomfortable to talk about. And, you know, in my experience of not having money, there were so many, you know, things that happened in our family as a result of poverty. You know, I, I only recently learned and talking with my mom that there were times where, uh, she didn't have food when I was growing up and like I, there would be like one piece of chicken and I would be at the table eating by myself while she was, I thought she was just cleaning up or had already eaten. And she was like, we literally only had one piece of chicken. Right. So the trauma that poverty imposes on communities and the trauma we have on about money has to be healed. We have to be ready to receive the abundance, right? If we don't know how to receive money or we feel unworthy or we feel we don't do our healing, then we get money. We'll only uh, continue to use it in a way to harm the way that we've seen it modeled. So we have to do our own healing. And of course, you know, um, white folks or uh, people with money, there's just, there's kind of the secrets and the family secrets and the isolation that comes with wealth that causes a lot of pain. So what we've been doing literally is holding healing summits. <clears throat> we've had about 175 funders to attend our healing summit so far. And we have a, on our staff, uh, a person trained in ancestral healing practices, um, Vyananda, and he has built a collective of healers, the, the DWP Healing Collective. Um, and we bring, we've been doing this all on Zoom so far. And it really initiated the first one, uh, first summit happened after the murder of George Floyd because I, my heart was aching for people of color working in philanthropy, especially black folks who are like directly impacted and are often the only black person on staff. And they're having, imagine going to work, making the case for black lives, you know, at a foundation and trying to move funding. Right. And so there was so much that people of color were holding and I didn't really know what was going to happen, but I just put out a call like, Hey, we just want to offer a space for people of color who, who are doing, who work in philanthropy and finance to just come together for some healing. And we brought together all of these, these healers. And literally we are, we, you register and you select a modality of healing that you're interested in trying. So like sound therapy, uh, for example, there are things that I still don't really know what they are because I haven't tried all of the modalities and I'm learning a lot about sort of ancestral practices of healing. And we, we come together, we have a, a opening ceremony, a prayer. It's a space where we leave identity at the door. I don't care where you work. We've had senior, senior folks from mega foundations. And I don't care today. You're, you're just, you're just Ryan and you're just the son of so-and-so and the grandson of so-and-so and the father of so-and-so. You're just a human being. 
I don't, you know, we are, we are always conditioned as people working at foundations to identify and quote the website and our identity is caught up in that organization's identity. We're not allowed to be human or to feel or to call in our ancestors in a meeting. So we have been showing people how to do that and just allowing them to exhale and to, to just be together and to call in the ancestors and to open up around about what, what hurts and what they're struggling with. And then they go into small groups with a healer where they literally practice a healing modality for an hour. And then we come back. And when I tell you, Ryan, like the amount of feedback that we've received about how transformative and I didn't know at first, I'm like, these things are four or five hours on Zoom. I don't want to attend anything for four or five hours on Zoom. We have people showing up and then asking for more. We've also been approached by increasingly from companies that want us to do these these programs. And we've done some stuff um, with the um, office of Melinda Gates. We're talking to Fidelity about coming in and doing healing programs with their entire 300 person charitable staff. I don't even know how we're going to do that. We just did a program with Giving Tuesday staff. So it's really beautiful. And especially for those of us who work in philanthropy, where we're literally should be talking about the love of people to be able to see people as a whole being and to experience healing. Because so much of the work of DEI is intellectual. We're training people on terminology. We're making the case for this. We're pulling the data for that. But to actually receive healing is just a really beautiful thing because the spirit and that type of healing can do so much more in a short amount of time than I could ever do in like a several hour seminar. We just had our very first session, uh, I think about last week or maybe two weeks ago for white people. It was all white folks. And, you know, we talked about the need for healing. And for some folks, it was the very first time they had ever said their grandparents name out loud that type of way or called in their ancestors and remembered who they were or to have a place to deal with the grief that sometimes accompanies being white and wanting to be set free from that so they can be a better co-conspirator right to dismantle um, white supremacy so it was beautiful it was just beautiful so i'm like obsessed i'm obsessed with pairing the conversations the actions with also this work of healing and in this time where we are all stressed out caring so much parents have become teachers like you know not the future is so uncertain like the climate has been out of control we just need these spaces to maintain our sanity really but um, also to kind of bring up all the stuff that we've had to suppress because we're expected to be robots you know and in these corporate spaces especially it's just been beautiful to see people express emotion to cry, to let it out, to express love toward each other. So it's it's a revival of healing and love. And, um, and that's a big part of this second edition of this book. I share how since the first book came out, I have really accepted the identity of being a healer. I didn't think of myself as a healer before. I'm not trained in ancestral healing practices, but what I do and, and what you're doing, Ryan, we're healers. We are sharing medicine. We're creating space for people to to talk, uh, to be real, to um, think about um, changes in their lives and in their practices. And that's a form of medicine and that's healing. So that's kind of my next wave of like campaign. Like I need to get the T-shirt. Maybe it's healer instead of the colonizer in this next round. But that's what I'm all about right now. And it's been really, really beautiful. It resonates so deeply with me. And yeah, I'm, I'm a little sad. I was like, oh, I missed the white person um, to collective trauma session. Let me know, <laughs> gotta let me know if you have any more of those. <laughs> well, we'll have more. Lots, lots yeah. more to come. And yeah, I, I think you're really on to something. I mean, you were on to, you've been on to something for many years, but this insight into collective trauma, but also the, the ancestral connection. I, I had, um, a woman, uh, Tamira Kuset, who's actually from North Carolina on the podcast a few weeks ago, and she does ancestral healing work. And it's just such a deeper layer of conversation and connection and like really getting at something that I feel like is needed in movement spaces or, you know, 
racial justice or dismantling white supremacy. It's just this this piece that is so it's like in our body. It's not it's like we can't talk about it. Like, oh, do we do I, should I donate $250 to this organization or it's just like that's all like a lot of it is up here and there's like a lack of connection with the like the core and like being more rooted. So I I've been on a sort of the last like couple of years being like, what does it mean to be in ancestral healing for myself? And uh, so I'm just really excited to hear that that's something you're tapping into as well. Cause it seems like it's really needed in the world. So. It's so needed. And, you know, I've just personally benefited from starting my own practice and to see, just to experience the liberation that comes with it. Um, I'm sold on it and everyone needs to kind of get into it. We need a lot of healing. Are there any resources <laughs> or things you would point folks to who are interested in that type of healing or maybe it's ancestral recovery? It's like so much different than ph- philanthropy, like where we started, <laughs> but it's all interrelated. Yeah. You know, I would definitely, we're working to compile more resources, but our website has a, a, a healing section um, where you can go and, and check out a couple resources. One of the things that we put out just toward the end of the year is a journal that's called um, Money as Medicine, and it's it's um, something that folks have expressed as being a support tool for healing. Um, it, it literally takes you through the seven steps of healing in the book and allows you to sort of meditate and journal and respond to questions there. So that's a tool. But, you know, on our website, we're building out um, sort of thinking through sort of a referral system to partner organizations that we're, we're funding um, to connect people with local resources. And absolutely anyone who works in the space of investing, philanthropy, money, we will have more of these um we're committed to offering them at least four times a year. So those will be advertised on our website. For all. Could you mention that just for folks? What's the website? And I know you have a newsletter and some of the other socials and other things just so folks know where to find you. Yeah, it's uh, decolonizingwealth.com is our website there and everything is there. Our socials, um, De- decolonizing wealth on Instagram and decolonize with a Z wealth on twitter but absolutely you can subscribe to our website and see all all of the resources we have available there what do you need right now and how can the listeners help you grow this next economy or this healing help in this sort of like larger movement you're helping to to steward you know in terms of you know partnering with us there there are lots of opportunities you know we we definitely produce a lot of events we are we're pushing out education a lot of our events are free if we, we have partner organizations who sometimes want to charge to support their work, which is fine. But you can definitely subscribe and join us for events. A major opportunity that I can extend to everyone is to consider joining Liber- Liberated Capital. Liberated Capital is a giving circle model. It's a donor community. We have we're approaching 400 members to Liberated Capital, which is phenomenal. There are no thresholds in terms of you have to give this much to be a member. We have people who can um, only afford $5 a month who are members, and we have others who give $5,000 a month. It is a space that's about pooling resources and supporting uh, black and brown communities. And, you know, it's we've been able to move millions of dollars together. So it's really powerful to understand the leveraging there. But we also have programming, and I'm really excited we just hired a full-time Director of Resource Mobilization, Sheena Brown, who will really be helping us to build out more programming for our Liberated Capital members. And we hold ceremony with them. We have speakers come in. We just did a, we did a series over the summer called uh, Sunday Medicine, where we met on Sundays and just had really wholesome healing types of conversations with folks sharing. So it's a community that anyone's invited to be a part of. And we just ask that you make a, you know, reasonable contribution to support the work. And, but if you're looking for a place for, for healing and just sort of radical imagination around what we can do with our money to support change in communities, check out Liberated Capital on our website. And what I like about that is one of the former guests was on the podcast was saying, it's not just donating money. You're, it's like, are you in a relationship? And is there some sort of reciprocity with the folks that you're donating to or supporting? At least for, I think for many white folks, it's like, I donated the 250 bucks, so I'm good for like fiscal year 2020 or something like that. And 
I imagine there's more of like reciprocity and relationship building in what you're talking about, right? There's like more of a reciprocal piece. I think so. You know, we we are experimenting, I think, to, to really understand, you know, again, in the community, there's no discernment of who's giving $500 or five, you know, it's we're, we're just all people there. And when we come together, we don't hold labels that kind of separate us and our many of the folks we support are also members of Liberated Capital. So they're in there giving $5 or 10 or 20 or whatever folks want to give. And so it is sort of bridging uh, wealth and class divide to be in this community. We also, unlike a lot of, you know, I guess other place giving circles or, you know, we, we don't um, necessarily are the members don't decide where the money goes. It's completely like a trust based system where we have a participatory process where community decides where that money goes. And so we're not there making decisions about funding. We're just there to get our healing. And that's, that's, it's a way to sort of uh, check out from that transactional way of like, Oh, I'm in this, you have no power about over the money. You know, the power is it's liberated. We're liberating the money. We're liberating you. We're liberating the, the community to have to answer to anyone. We've had donors to say, Oh, I want to give this money to this state. And we, we just don't do that. We're like, it goes into a pot and it goes to community, but absolutely we do create opportunities for um, our donors to be in relationship and learn from our, our grantees. We post all of our grantees. We direct donors to give directly to these organizations. We make connections where people are interested. So we are, you know, definitely a facilitator of grantees or and of donors meeting grantees. And we also at times help people understand how they should behave in doing so, right? So for example, during COVID, a donor wanted me to facilitate a trip for them to the Southwest to meet with Native folks. And I was like, that's not appropriate. We're in a pandemic. The borders are closed and they are uh, responding to crisis. So like you could just give us your money. We'll make sure it goes where it needs to go. And we'll, you know, watch the news or read a website. You can learn that way. <laughs> Well, again, Edgar, I want to appreciate you again, third time coming on the podcast, really respect everything you're doing. And I'm excited. I feel like what you're building feels liberatory and there's sort of a abundance that you're bringing to, to what is often a very scarce mindset in the world. Yeah, a very scarce mindset in the world. And yeah, so I just want to thank you for being on the show. Thank you, Ryan. I appreciate that. You've definitely been a great friend to this work. And, you know, from, from day one, we met pretty early in this journey that I've been on. So I appreciate you always cheering me on. And I received that with a lot of gratitude. Next Economy Now is a production of Lift Economy. To listen to all of our episodes, go to lifteconomy.com slash podcast. That's L-I-F-T economy.com slash podcast. You can also sign up for our monthly newsletter at lifteconomy.com slash newsletter. Please also rate and review our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.